Welcome, Bible nerds, to our seventh installment of the Isaiah Intensive. So tonight, we're covering chapters 18 through 20, and uh, I'd like to start our, call, our class off with a little bit of a brief synopsis of where we've been. So remember, chapters 1 through 12, a little check on learning here, I've been calling that a what? Starts with an M, ends with an M. A, so it gives us a kind of a small synopsis of what the entirety of the Isaiah scroll is going to be moving through because it starts off with a pronouncement of judgment concerning Judah, Jerusalem. But by the end of that segment, when we get to chapter 12, and we've already seen some brief intersperses of this throughout the context of that, the renewal of all things, and God, of course, moving to reconcile humanity to himself through a renewed Israel. And chapters 66, 65 and 66 of Isaiah really give us a much more long and drawn out picture of that, right? And we'll watch ourselves move through this movement in chapters 13 all the way up to 16. So with that, chapters 1 through 12, we would consider a micro cosm. There we go. Seriously, guys, the dude that hadn't even been here I'll one that. time. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah, here yeah. one time. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. I thought I was confusing you being here with the Torah class. I guess ended several months ago, so you know you could tell where my brain's at. So yeah, awesome. Thanks. Maybe that was one time. <laughs> microcosm. <laughs> I like <clears throat> it is one of my favorite words. I use it a lot. Uh, so a microcosm of the entirety of the Isaiah scroll, and then as we started in chapter thirteen, recognizing the sign of a new division of material, because chapters one and two pretty much begin with the same formula. The visions of, or whatever your translation might say that might be akin to that, of Isaiah, son of Amos, concerning. But again, chapters 1 and 2 contained pretty much in the same unit of 1 through 12. We get this again in the beginning of chapter 13, signaling to us that now we're moving on to a new set of collections. And I, I use some different words uh, interchangeably with that, collages or whatever the case might be, to help us understand that these oracles may be fragments of messages that Isaiah preached in much greater uh, breadth and scope, but were <clears throat> either pieced together in the, the quilt that we have now by Isaiah, or it could have been a collaborative effort between Isaiah and the disciples he references in chapter 8, which was a known thing, a phenomenon that you would expect in Isaiah's day, stemming from days like those of Samuel and certainly in Elijah and Elisha, where we have the school of the prophets or the sons of the prophets. And with that, it would be anticipated, even in Jesus' day, right? No respectable rabbi can walk around with any less than 70 disciples. Where did those traditions come from? These kinds of places. And so with that, that they are working to help him interweave this into the setup we have now to preach the bigger thematic message to a larger audience than just those who heard Isaiah speak when he spoke, right? And so with that, while oftentimes we can't really tell why this piece may seem disjointed, what was it a part of earlier? It doesn't matter. It's a part of where it is now. God, through his spirit, has seeded it here, and he has embedded it in the larger context of this chapter, which is an oracle or a series of oracles or whatever. And all of them collectively are giving us a theme and the theme for this 10-chapter corridor is the nations. But, of course, when we say nations, we're not talking about everything that blankets every continent. We're only talking about those nations, not even in the full spectrum of the biblical purview, just those nations that surround the tiny little kingdom of Judah. We've had several of them enumerated so far. We got from 13 all the way to chapter 17, and in that march we had... Six nations from 13 all the way up to 17. We'll call it 17A. But there's a tiny little chunk at the end of 17A we would call B, which just gives us an understanding of all the nations and their fate, that they are like roiling, raging seas, primordial water from the creation story, threatening to overtake God's new Eden space. That was Israel until it was defiled by their kings and their apostasies and blasphemies. But nonetheless, God is not spurning his covenant people altogether. And as God rebukes the waves in the creation story, so God rebukes the waves of the nations that are coming to threaten his people. And such will be the fate of all of those who attempt to come against us. That's what he ends that chapter with. And then we get to another six nations on the other side of that. So tonight, in our material, 18 through 20, 
between this and maybe the next two or three lessons, we'll get through the rest of what these nations <clears throat> are about. And remember, another thing that we have seen thematically through this is that maybe not with everyone because we've got disproportionate material. We might have a few verses for one nation and almost a whole chapter and a half for another nation. Why? Don't know. Doesn't matter. And with every one of those nations, it's not the same with respect to the idea of God offering the chance for refuge or the chance for redemption. But with some of these, we get that picture that might be mentioned specifically for that nation or it might be hinting at the prospect of a much broader sense of redemption for the Gentile nations, which Isaiah is beginning to clue us in on the fact that the nations have a prominent role to play in God's eschatological, big word, lots of syllables, but it's pointing to the end of all things and how God is going to wrap up human history. And it's a place where we get a very good seedbed germinating from seeds already laid down in places in the, in the Old Testament that span more than a thousand years before this material was ever written or spoken. But where God is showing, he has not given up on the nations. Abraham's people are the conduit by which the nations are going to be reconciled and redeemed. And he's also giving us the understanding that Israel is breaking off into two different stems. And there is ethnic Israel, and then there is, we can call either true I don't really like using the term spiritual because that almost makes it sound like there are promises given to Israel that the rest of the nations do not get access to. And the rest of the Bible spectrum, especially New Testament authors, know nothing of the sort. So, but also saying true Israel almost brings to, to light or to the surface some things that some of us might have issues with as goes the doctrine of replacement theology or whatever, which is bad terminology. But I would use true Israel in the sense that Israel, per our, uh, Paul's argument in Romans 8 and 9, uh, or uh, 9 through 11, is the understanding that Israel has always been something of a remnant, even in the days of Elijah, that God has been working with that have been the true and faithful followers. The rest are just branches that are fruitless that he has been working to hack off throughout the millennia they have existed as the ethnic descendants of Abraham, Right? And so when we get the idea that God is grafting in wild branches to this tree, he doesn't knock the tree down to then grow a new one, that is the nations. He is just grafting in the branches to the original tree so that they can flourish from the life-giving sap of the host tree. So that's what true Israel is. And when Isaiah is speaking like that in certain places, it's kind of a little difficult for us to determine oh, which Israel is he speaking about. Is he speaking about ethnic Israel and those people who don't want to be a part of God's plan? He doesn't want to follow God's servant that is going to come up in the end of this book around chapter 42. And ultimately, the closing statements and the closing synopsis of a new Jerusalem and thereby a renewed cosmos. But if they don't want to be a part of that, where else is there? Isaiah gives us the picture. There is the city, and outside the city is just the ash heap and the mound of destruction that is everything else that is not a part of this new creation. So you've got two choices, right? And that's where ethnic Israel that does not want to be a part of true Israel is headed to. In other words, this branch is going to be cut off while this branch is going to be nurtured, maintained, and flourished, right? And we've already got something of a hint of that from Isaiah 11, the picture of the stump that was the line of Jesse, but a new shoot's going to grow from Jesse, a new David is going to come, and from him he's going to branch off and fill the land, Isaiah 4, beautify Zion in the days of the end, when all nations in Isaiah 2 will come streaming up to the summit of the mountain. All right, so having said all that, let's jump in. So, Isaiah 18, I would direct your attention first to the map on the right side of the screen. Now, what you'll notice there is that this, if you can see past the red, I know it might not be the clearest map in the world, but hopefully you're familiar enough with your ancient Near Eastern geography, which of course corresponds to modern day topography, to understand this is the ancient kingdom of Egypt. However, at this particular time period, Egypt, while still called Egypt, is no longer a sovereign nation ruling themselves. In fact, let me get my little laser pointer up here on the screen. Ancient Egypt was once two kingdoms separated right around there, and this was known as Lower Egypt, which, you know, is kind of confusing. And then, of course, is Upper Egypt. 
They were unified and had been for centuries now under several dynasties, and they are unified once again, but they are not unified under host Egyptian or native Egyptian rule. Instead, they are being actively ruled by the people who for quite some time were once the subjects of the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, what we might also call the Nubian tribes, and what is today present-day Sudan, that they at this point have gained the upper hand and have conquered all of Upper and Lower Egypt, and now the Pharaoh that rules is a sub-Saharan African with deep black skin, right, that has adopted all of the practices of ancient Egypt, including their religion, their uh, funerary beliefs, you name it. They consider themselves to not be native Egyptians, but to be the ones who have become the bearers of these traditions. So it's important for us to think with this in mind, because with this first oracle opening addressing the kingdom of Cush, Cush is Ethiopia, and Ethiopia has now become the captors and conquerors of ancient Egypt, ruling this entire swath of land that was once the mighty nation of Egypt. Okay, so starting with, woe to the land of buzzing insects beyond the rivers of Cush. So if you see there, that kind of red oval, a little darker than the map outline there, that identifies for us the two capital cities of what had always been the Cush kingdom, and is certainly at this point in time, you'll see that there is a branching off of the Nile into several different tributaries. So it certainly is a land of not just one river, the main river, the Nile, but in this case, pinpointing for us a little more accurately, it is indeed a land of many rivers, which send envoys by sea and reed vessels over the water. If you've ever actually seen a picture of this or maybe saw it dramatized in a movie, this was a moniker, a hallmark of ancient Egypt. This is how they made their seafaring craft, reed boats. Imagine taking grass planted by the Nile and finding a way to make that stuff not only thatchable but waterproof enough to be able to carry large tonnage of cargo on it up and down the Nile in the various cities that you need to ship things to and certainly for Pharaoh to be able to get out there and sail up and down it. Nonetheless, <clears throat> I'm getting ahead of myself. Go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth skin to a people feared far and near, a powerful nation with a strange language, whose land is divided by rivers. All you inhabitants of the world and you who live on the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, look. When a ram's horn sounds, listen. All right. So we've already kind of identified the fact who we're talking to here. But now what's interesting, as we appreciate the fact this is indeed Cush, is that... This is a little bit strange for the breakdown of the nations that Isaiah has given us so far. Everybody he's talked about, with exception to Assyria, are people who share some border with the ancient kingdom of Israel. When I say that, I mean the unified kingdom, not just the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Assyria, on the other hand, would be a little bit more understandable, right? I mean, Assyria has been a dominant world power at this point. They've had their moments of waxing and waning and the changing over of different dynasties and the same kind of political intrigues that many nations have experienced. But a new king in the days of Jotham, um, yeah, I was about to say Joram, but I'm pretty sure it's Jotham, uh, Uzziah's son, tiglath the III, a very domineering Assyrian emperor, has come to the throne, and of course with that, just like we start talking about the prospects of what happens under a new political regime in our own country or in other countries, you have to know that had to be buzzing throughout the land of Israel at the time. What does this mean? For some time, several decades now, Assyrian power has kind of been waning. Most of those emperors had been turning inward. Now the focus is outward with a press and the eye toward the west, which means everybody on the western side of the Euphrates needs to be on alert and concerned. So it would make sense that Isaiah, as he's already done in the previous 12 chapters, is now addressing Assyria again. But Egypt? Egypt kind of shares a border with them, but not really. I mean, it's to their south, but there are plenty of different other tribes of people that live out in the deserts between Judah and Egypt. And so Egypt is not so much an imminent threat because they got land across, and they're not really that much of a threat as they were in days past. They're seeking to reassert their authority and credibility, but as we'll see, those plans will not come to fruition. So with this, 
What we should appreciate, perhaps, is that as goes just looking at the four points of, on the, of the compass and everywhere where the Bible gives us a purview of where people inhabit the known world, there's nothing ever mentioned south of Ethiopia or Cush. So for Isaiah and the people who would hear this oracle and read it later on, this is the fringe of the known world. It doesn't matter that there are people who populate areas below that. It's just that these people in some way have shaped the story of Israel, having a very pivotal role to play in it, as many of these other nations that surround them do. And now Assyria, who had never really been mentioned before, briefly hinted at in Genesis chapter 2 with one of those rivers that come out of Eden and flow around the area that Ashur, or the uh, progenitor of Assyria, will one day populate. But nobody thought or any, cared at all about Assyria, though obviously a civilization has existed there for more than a thousand years before the days of Isaiah. But they're important now because they threaten everybody in the area. Having said that, this is the way we should be thinking about this oracle, that Isaiah is now reaching out beyond just the terrestrial realm or playground of where Israel and Judah reside. He's going to the fringes of the map. So go swift messengers. Now take this in for a second. Up in verse 2, he starts off with, which sends envoys by sea in reed vessels over water. So with that, who is sending envoys by sea in the terms of nations, Egypt or Judah? Or maybe I should say Cush, but Cush and Egypt are synonymous at this point. So who is sending envoys by sea in boats made out of reeds? Egypt, okay. So with this, when we get this phrase, go swift messengers, moving on, messengers from whom to whom, and the reason why we ask that is because the next paragraph is, to a nation, tall, smooth skin, to a people feared far and near, a powerful nation with a strange language whose land is divided by rivers. So those four lines are talking about who? Again, in terms of nations, the people of Cush or the people of Judah? Cush, exactly. They're taller. I mean, just understanding the paleontology behind it, Africans have long since enjoyed the height advantage over most average-sized people. And while we might not have many graves to have excavated from this particular time period, what we can say from other archaeological evidence is that Jewish men of this time were about average height, like we are, somewhere between about 5'8 and 5'10. So certainly not tall. Smooth skin thing, let's just put that on the shelf for the second. But people feared far and near. Judah has no domineering presence on the world stage. This would make no sense of them. A powerful nation, obviously Cush has domineered and conquered Egypt, so they are a powerful nation. A land divided by rivers again. That makes no sense in the context of Judah. But when we read these two verses together, Go swift messengers to a nation. Are you catching this? So Cush is sending envoys by sea on reed boats. But now Isaiah is saying, go swift messengers to the people of Cush. Which way is this going? This is confusing. Like sending envoys to whom? It would seem that Egypt is sending envoys on up to Judah. But why are messengers being directed to go from at least the direction of Judah down to Cush? presumably to deliver a message. And then in verse 3, we just blow this whole thing wide open with, <clears throat> well, before I get there, let me review, catch up with my slide. So let's just make sure we understand. Cush is sending envoys, and the reason why is because this guy, this is Pharaoh Pi, P-I-Y-E, or he's also known by the name of Pianka, who has come to rule at this particular time. He is not the first Cushite king by no means, but he is one of the first kings of the 25th dynasty of Egyptian pharaohs. And so now that he has ascended to the throne of a unified upper and lower Egypt as one consolidated kingdom again and feeling pretty good about himself, what he is doing is sending envoys out to the kingdoms of the southern Levantine area. So we're talking Philistia, we're talking Judah, Edom, and then Moab as well. And then, of course, when it comes to Philistia, there are five capital cities, and all of them have their own kingdoms, so you, or kings, so you have to deal with them individually. But he's sending envoys to these people for the simple sake of, hey, Assyria is on the rise. We know they're threatening the area. At this point, they may have already, depending on when this is, done some critical damage to some of these uppermost kingdoms of Aram and whatnot, 
the Hittites, and with all of that, we know they're coming for us next. So we need to have a unified front. And Cush slash Egypt is the biggest kid with the biggest stick on the playground at this point, other than Assyria. But they do not have the might, power, and resources to stand alone against them. They need the help of these other kingdoms. But Assyria is going to come to them first. So in other words, hey, if they come to you, or if you feel it's necessary for you to rise up and let Assyria know, you can't bully me anymore, I've got your back. That's what essentially this is tantamount to. But with all of this, it seems that Yahweh is sending messengers back to Cush. And the message then would be given out to all the inhabitants of the world. Hence, when I said earlier, this is the fringes of the known world, the edge of the map for Isaiah and the Bible readers of this time. He is shouting this message out from these messengers going back to Cush, saying to all the inhabitants of the world and you who live on the earth, hey, when you get obvious signals that something's stirring, like a banner raised up on the hill, think about the old cavalry days and the old signal corps with the United States Army when we actually used flags to motion battle movements on the field between different formations and units. Much the same thing. When a ram's horn, all these ancient kingdoms would use these means of communication out on the field when battles are actually underway. So the obvious signals of something happening, you need to pay attention. What do they need to pay attention to? God's announcement. So as all the world is called to pay attention, we understand as this filters into the fact this is the edge of the world French territory, that this message obviously has implications with respect to the Gentiles. Maybe at this point we could ask the question, so when the envoys actually come up to Judah, and obviously these are Cushite uh, emissaries representing the interests of the king, is Isaiah sending Judite emissaries back with them with this message, maybe his disciples? Or is he burdening these Cushite emissaries to go back to their own king and give the king the words of God's prophet in that this is what God has to say as goes the plans that you, O king, are crafting. The schemes that you are concocting about getting a coalition of nations together, this is what the God of heaven and earth has to say with respect to that. So we start in verse 4. But first I want to read to you a little passage, and I'm doing this to kind of warm you up a little bit. I want to get your mind thinking, the juices flowing a little bit more than they already are. So just taking a peek back to Isaiah 10, you don't have to turn there, you can just listen to what I'm saying. Isaiah 10, 32, all the way up through the first half of verse 1 of chapter 11. Isaiah says, Today the Assyrians will stand at Nob, shaking their fists at the mountain of daughter Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Look, the Lord God of armies will chop off the branches with terrifying power. So think about that. Assyria seems to be poised as the lumberjack, right? That's what we went over when we were there. And they're going to be the one chopping the tree down and taking the branches off. And if that's the case, if they're shaking their fist at daughter Zion, then who exactly is the, the tree that's going to be cut down by the Assyrians? It's Jerusalem. It's Judah, right? Exactly. They'll be cutting it down with terrifying power, and the tall trees will be cut down. The high trees will be felled. He is clearing the thickets of the forest with an axe, and Lebanon with its mighty majesty will fall. But then, and this is how we know it's referencing Israel, or at least Jerusalem and Judah, because we start off the next oracle in chapter 11 from the vantage point of a tree that's been cut down, and there's nothing but a stump left. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse. So keep that in your mind as we begin to read these verses, because we're going to come across something very similar. All right. So, for the Lord said to me, I will quietly look out from my place like shimmering heat and sunshine, like a rain cloud in harvest heat. For before the harvest, when the blossoming is over and the blossom becomes a ripening grape, he will cut off the shoots with a pruning knife and tear away and remove the branches. They will all be left for the birds of prey on the hills and for the wild animals of the land. The birds of prey will spend the summer feeding on them and the wild animals, the winter, meaning the winter feeding on them. At that time, a gift will be brought to the Lord of armies from a people, tall and smooth skin, a people feared far and near, a powerful nation with a strange language whose land is divided by rivers. And that gift will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord of armies. Let's try to break this down a little bit. So the Lord says, I will quietly look out 
from my place. I think it would be important for us to understand, coming from previous sections of Scripture that have already been laid down for us up to this point, that phrase, my place, has specific reference to some particular place where it's known that the Lord dwells. But there are notably two locations we should have in mind, and they come from the same spot. 1 Kings chapter 8, which if you're familiar enough with Scripture, that means you're already thinking, I'm back in Jerusalem, it's a great festive occasion, everybody's gathered together because we've got something new and unprecedented in Israel. Anybody know what that is? I'm not speaking in tongues, I'm just mimicking the fact I hear whispers. It's Solomon, and he's dedicating the newly finished temple with the ark's installation. And this is this mighty long prayer that he gives to dedicate this house unto the Lord of heaven, who he wants to come dwell in this house that he knows can't contain him. But he says succinctly in verse 13 and 30, 13, I have indeed built an exalted temple for you, a place for your dwelling forever. Right? So the idea is, just like it was with the tabernacle, he's going to dwell in this place. That's why the tabernacle was called by two names, one a mishkan, a dwelling place. But also in verse 30, when he's speaking about the prayers that might be given for whatever reason, hear the petition of your servant and your people Israel when they pray toward this place. And may you hear in your dwelling place in heaven. Which is it? Is his dwelling place in heaven or the temple? Yes, exactly. You read my mind. Perfect. Exactly. It's one and the same. Heaven and earth are united together in the precincts of this one place, right? So that gives us the idea, divorcing us from deist theology, that God didn't just wind up the watch that he put together and then walk away from it and let it tick on its own. That he is here on the earth's purview our level of vantage, and he sees and knows all, which he didn't have to be here. But with that in mind, he obviously is invested, which I think would help us make a little better sense of this next phrase, which I think is a little puzzling. Like shimmering heat and sunshine, which you and I can easily understand that reference. But when we're using this simile to give us the comparison, and God is saying, I will quietly look out from my place. That gives us the idea of a guy standing in a door looking out from his dwelling place at something that he intends to see. Okay, well, if we liken that in comparison to shimmering heat and sunshine, how does shimmering heat and sunshine see? What does that mean? But when we just take in this particular case, the mental image of what we're seeing, or what we should see, is the understanding that the shimmering heat is always present. When the sun is up and it's hot and it's beating down on the land, whether we see it or not, that heat is radiating up from the surface. And with the right vantage point in our visual spectrum, we can see those little wavy lines, right? All the more present in a context like this with something to bounce back that heat like hot asphalt. But I think what this could help us understand is that the shimmering heat it's always present. So based off the connection of my place, shimmering heat on a hot day, Yahweh is not a silent third party. He's always present. And he is intimately invested. Take the next piece, like a rain cloud in harvest heat, always looming up there, giving just enough shade from the heat, right? And threatening to bring rain, which might cool them off in the process of harvesting whatever crop is going on. So that is an assurance of sorts. But let's go on to understand what this means when he gets into verse 5. For before the harvest, when the blossoming is over. So it might not be a question that immediately jumps out into mind, but I'm hoping to coach you into thinking this way. This is the reason why we call it an intensive, because I'm trying to help set some guideposts, some parameters for helping you better understand the book and not exhaustively expound the material. So when he's referencing a harvest, is this harvest a reference to an actual season, like a harvest that's going to transpire of bringing in the barley, the spelt, the grain? Or is this harvest a reference, a metaphorical reference to something else? We've already kind of seen that imagery at play by Isaiah and other parts of this scroll already where he's talked about cutting down trees, burning forests. So with these botanical references in mind, and in every one of those instances, it's judgment. Perhaps we should be thinking that way already. Now, as good students of Scripture, if we paid attention to those details, 
That doesn't mean we twist the text to make it fit our point of view. We have to let the text speak for itself, and if it points us in another direction, in a more positive direction, we have to let that play out. So let's see what comes of this. Oh, well, the blossom becomes a ripening grape, and he will cut off the shoots with a pruning knife. I think all of us in here would probably be very hard-pressed to find God using that phrase, cut off or cutting off, in any positive context in Scripture. I mean, it's used over and over again, especially in the Levitical drill-down of the words of that book, Leviticus, speaking to what will happen if a particular code is not adhered to, that this person will be cut off, cut off from the entire community, right? They are thrown over to God's mercy for whatever he wants to do with them, but they are no longer a part of Abraham's people. So considering the way prophets like to recycle phrases like this, to trigger our minds to think about other sections of Scripture like this as a hyperlink, I think it would be very fairly evident in this point to see cutting off the shoots with a pruning knife. While that could be healthy to a plant, to prune it so that the negative growth, the stuff that's not producing anything fruitful, can give way to more fruitful growth by giving over what it's sapping from the main vine or uh, trunk or branch over to the branches that are actually yielding something. But then he says, and tear away and remove the branches. So I don't think we can say this is a pruning effort for the sake of trying to make the plant stronger. He is going to completely dismember the tree by tearing off its branches. So would you say at this point this is a positive or a negative thing? Seems to be a sign of judgment, right? And so next question I would say, because we should be paying attention to these things, the English majors that we are, right? Who is the he in this verse? From verse 4, we have a first-person pronoun, I, which we know is Yahweh speaking, looking out quietly from his place. But in verse 5, we have a new pronoun introduced, and we have to ask the question, did God change then to a second-person pronoun? I believe it's second person. Don't quote me on that. I'm not an English major. Don't judge me. But nonetheless, who is this? Who is the he in this particular frame of reference? Is it, the sheep from chapter it could be, but we have to... Okay. So you're thinking that the, the he is who? Lord. You think it's the, the Lord. Okay, so... Let's play this out. It could be one or the, or, or the other. We have to see where the chain of evidence may lead us to. Aaron's way of looking at this is not inappropriate by no means because of the simple fact we have the understanding the Lord is going to be doing some pruning work if by proxy of someone else to bring then a healthy and new shoot from the stump of Jesse, right? So perhaps that's what we're looking at or maybe it is the Lord, okay? He goes on to say in verse 6, well, before I get there, again, I got ahead of myself just a bit. We see from these phrases, cutting off shoots, tearing away, removing branches, the use or employment of birds of prey, predatory animals of the sky who come down and scavenge food or just take their own kill if they want, and, of course, wild animals that are not tamed and domesticated. All of these are usually mental pictures that are used poetically by biblical authors in context of judgment to help us understand the judgment is supposed to be quite devastating, that now... A once bustling and inhabited land has been reduced to a wasteland that now has become the haunt of jackals, right? Or in the case of Jezebel, right? She's going to be fed over to the wild dogs who will lap up her blood or that of Ahab, right? So with that in mind, we get to this last part of verse 6. The birds of prey will spend the summer feeding on them and all the wild animals the winter. Okay, so at this point, we have a couple more questions to ask. Who is the branch? Or better yet, whatever this is, whether it's a vine or a tree, maybe I should have said that instead. Who is the vine or who is the tree in this? As we're also working to try to answer who is the he that is reaping this devastation on this vine or tree by cutting off all the ripe fruit and all the branches that bore it. If we let Scripture interpret Scripture, what have we gotten laid down to us already as a reference for a nation group that's being spoken of as a tree. Remember, I read you something from Isaiah 10. The Assyrians stand at Nob, shaking that fist. Right, so Israel in that particular context is pictured as a tree, and of course, Assyria being the axeman 
And then it goes on in the context of 11 to speak about how, or I'm sorry, the rest of chapter 10, to speak about how Assyria has exalted themselves as instead of recognizing they are truly the axe, not the axe man, and the axe should never vaunt itself over the one wielding it because it's a useless tool without someone holding it in their hands. Nonetheless, we've got the clear picture that Assyria is coming to be the tool of God's judgment like an axe against a branch, and axe wins every time. So is it possible, and maybe we should burgeon beyond that, maybe appropriate to bring those images forward, since Isaiah has already kind of defined that for us, into this context? If it is, then that helps us clear some of this up. The God of Israel looking down over his vine, his tree, he's planted, but he's uh, uh, presuming to bring judgment upon it for all the wickedness that Isaiah has already expounded upon, and he is choosing to use Assyria to do that. So if Assyria is going to be lopping off branches, then that would be the he of verse 5. But now notice this. When he says, they, meaning the branches, will be left for the birds of prey on the hills and the wild animals. If you're thinking about the concept of maybe a vine, because we're talking about in verse 5, ripening grapes, when you go to harvest ripe grapes, are you just going to throw them on the ground for the wild animals to eat? What are you going to do with that? It's, it's valuable stuff. You're going to be smashing that up and not into your favorite jams or jellies, right? You're going to be making tons and tons of wine out of this to drink and, of course, to sell and make a profit from, especially if it comes from good, more renowned vineyards. But for the branches to be laid out for the birds of prey and wild animals to eat, let's think about this. This has caused us to put our thinking caps on for a second. The beginning of this chapter was speaking about the envoys coming from the kingdom of Cush, Egypt, up into Judah to say, hey, we know what Assyria is doing and we know they're coming. We need to stand together and we're going to be the one to back your play because we have all the tools and resources you need, right? And of course, that doesn't come without ulterior motives on Egypt's part. Having said that, Assyria is going to come. And God has already pronounced in former chapters through Isaiah what he is going to allow them to do to this tree. But he's also pronounced judgment on Assyria. So with respect to the idea of these schemes and plans that Assyria has in mind and that the king of Egypt has in mind, when the branches are chopped off after the judgment is done, who is going to reap the harvest? Who is going to get the benefit, the wealth of the spoil of all of this? Is the king of Assyria going to come out the one who is the, the true champion and the winner? Well, if we know our Bible, we know that's not the case. Hezekiah, Sennacherib, angel of the Lord, that showdown doesn't end well for the latter party. And for the king of Egypt, he doesn't get what he wants out of this either. Hence those ulterior motives which we're about to explore here in just a second. So in other words, what we're supposed to be reading between the lines, I think, in all of this is simply this. You have your plans, and you have your plans. But I, says the Lord, have my plans. And guess who's going to win in the end? And guess whose plans are going to be spoiled? This is a season of judgment, and this season of judgment apparently is going to last for quite a while, as goes the effects of it, because you think about the picture of them spending all summer feeding off this harvest and even up to the winter time. But this isn't how this ends. This is a devastating picture. But in verse 7, notice this. As this message is supposed to be delivered either by Judite or Cushite emissaries to the king of Egypt slash Cush, this is how this oracle will end in verse 7. At that time, a gift will be brought to the Lord. And the description of the people bringing it is the exact same description given to the messengers being sent back to the kingdom of tall, smooth-skinned people who have a reputation of renown that are feared far and near. A powerful nation that obviously doesn't speak the language of Canaan, they will be bringing gifts to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord. So once again, we have a picture here of redemption and reconciliation of yet another foreign power on the fringes of the map. So this redemption seems to go everywhere in which God is yet again going to be bringing in Gentile nations into the seed root, the stock of Israel. Make sense? Kinda? Need more time to chew on it? Well, we don't have that time. I'm sorry. We've got to go on. All right. Chapter 19. Any questions so far on 18? Have no fear. 19 is our longest chapter, but we'll, we'll be able to move through it, I think, with relative ease. Chapter 20 is only like, I think, seven verses. So 
not going to take us long to get through that. All right. So now, what would normally happen if we weren't good students of Scripture and looking at our Bible maps and being appreciating history for what it is, even though there's some plasticity to it and things get revised and changed every now and again, nonetheless, some of this stuff's pretty solid in where it sits, that if we weren't those good Bible students, then we might be thinking as we're moving from Cush over to Egypt, this is a whole different oracle to a whole different people. It's not. If we recognize what the map shows, what's going on at this time as far as geopolitical events, Egypt and Cush are one and the same, all right? So we're just extending this out in a way. But also in a way, this does kind of go beyond just the Cushite people because the Cushites have taken over the native Egyptians. So in a way, this could be speaking directly to those people who were once the captains of their own fate to an extent, rulers of their own sovereign power, and will one day again be in the near future as Cushite dominance will wane. But nonetheless, a Masa, a burden, pronouncement concerning Egypt. So remember... Egypt under Cushite rule. Look, the Lord rides on a swift cloud. So quick, all of you Bible nerds that just know the Psalms like every freckle on your arm like I got, what Psalm does that reference? And go. Wow. Just wow. That's awesome. Yes, absolutely. References Psalm 18 verses 10 through 12, where we got the picture of the Lord coming down, riding on the clouds on the back of a cherub, or a cherub, right? And he is going to be hurling lightning bolts at the dangerous threat to David. Psalm 18, Psalm 22, they are one and the same. And it's David giving us this very picturesque appearance of God coming to deliver him from his enemies, which are being pictured as hands and cords or ropes dragging him down the mountain to the base of it where there's nothing but the chaotic water that separates the living realm from the realm of the dead. Sheol, that's what he says, dragging me down to Sheol. But God saves him. He delivers him. Bless you. He exalts him at the end of it all. So one of two things at least is going on here. Either Isaiah is just simply recycling the image for the gusto that it gives as goes God riding on clouds, or he intends, perhaps, to create a link between the two to demonstrate something. Let's explore and see what we find. So, Psalm 18, Yahweh's the cloud rider coming to help the distressed David. But here in Isaiah 19, he's coming to judge Egypt. It's not David's enemies here, it's Egypt, which in a sense, at least in times past, has been the enemy of God's people, right? We go back to the entire book of Exodus and we see that playing out for what it is. And that reverberates beyond just that context to where Moses tells these people God's clear advice or instruction to them is you don't make treaties with him. You do not go back there. You don't import horses. You do have nothing to do with them, essentially. You are not to go back by that way again. So here, if that's the case, if he is judging Egypt, but we look at it from the framework of Psalm 18, where God is not only judging, but he's also rescuing. And we know in this context of Isaiah 19 who the target of judgment is. That leaves open a vacant space. What's the vacant space? We've got those who are being judged. What's the other thing we need to figure out? Okay, so that's a part of it. Yeah, those are definitely details that are important. But if God is... In Psalm 18, if God is judging and rescuing, we take that over to to Isaiah 19. We know who God's judging. What have we yet to solve? Who he's rescuing. That's right. So we keep on. Look, the Lord rides on a swift cloud, and he's coming to Egypt. Egypt's worthless idols will tremble before him, and Egypt will lose heart. I will provoke Egyptians against Egyptians. Each will fight against his brother, and each against his friend. City against city, kingdom against kingdom, Egypt's spirit will be disturbed within it, and I will frustrate its plans. Then they will inquire of worthless idols, ghosts, mediums, and spiritists. And we'll stop here to digest what we have, but we understand this oracle goes further. So, considering Egypt's worthless idols will tremble before him, this takes us back to Exodus chapter 12. This is the night when Passover is going to be observed in the tenth and final plague. And when God gives the time frame for when he is going to move into Egypt and execute this plan... What does he say he is going to be doing against the gods of Egypt? He's going to be bringing what against them? Judgment. Judgment. That's exactly right. He's bringing 
judgment against them. So this is fascinating if you think about it, because if we're looking at the concept of Egypt being the target of judgment, and here this reference of them and their worthless idols trembling before them, also a target of God's judgment, that takes us back to this story of the Exodus when Egypt was once before the target of God's judgment, right? And he judged their idols, their gods that night to demonstrate who was sovereign, who is all-powerful, versus who is really nothing, okay? So with that, if Egypt's gods are being judged, we know the frame of the story goes back to the Exodus story. Then he goes on to say in verse 2, I will provoke Egyptians against Egyptians. Now, this might be interesting, as goes at least the historical tangent if we're trying to properly situate this. So, one of these Egyptian emperors that is bent on conquest, Esharadon, he comes down around about 673 to attempt to try to invade and conquer Egypt. It doesn't go so well, and the Egyptians actually get the upper hand on him. And part of that was because he marched his soldiers so quickly across the Levantine area to get down to this spot that they were exhausted and didn't have the stamina for battle. So two years later when he regroups and he brings down a new army, it's a slow and very methodical pace to keep the armies and the cavalry rested. So when they arrive, they are ready and peaked for battle. And buddy, when they show up, they show up. So in 671, he conquers Memphis, which I'll show you on the map where that is here in a second because it continues to be a theme in this. But he conquers Memphis, a very important and powerful city for them. And by virtue of this, Cushite rule Egypt is now split into two kingdoms once again because Lower Egypt, which is actually at the northern part of the, the map, is now under Assyrian control. And what was originally Cushite land and part of Upper Egypt or toward the bottom of the map is now effectively under Cushite control, at least for the time being, unless the Assyrians have something to say about that. So when you think about that, provoking Egyptians against Egyptians, Imagine what it would be like living at this time. You're a native Egyptian, but the Pharaoh that sits on your throne is not Egyptian. He's a Cushite. So foreign invaders have occupied your land. You're a nationalist. You're a patriot to your people. But does that mean every Egyptian is? Probably not. How are things under Nubian rule? Pretty good. So if things are good, and I'm benefiting from it, I don't care what the skin color of the person is that sits on the throne or what they call themselves. As long as they're not coming to kick down my door and take my family and make them slaves and kill all my animals and make me go work out in the mines, whatever. I'm fine with that. Whereas others are like, are you serious? I mean, this is how we're going to live as second-class citizens or whatever they saw themselves for the rest of our lives and the lives of our children and their children? No, we've got to do something about this. So with that, you can easily see a scenario where there's internal strife, and now the Assyrians are coming to town. How does that play out in these two different camps? The nationalist guys like... You're darn tootin'. Now we got somebody that's got a bigger stick than we do that's going to come and kick those guys out. And maybe they'll put a native Egyptian back on the throne because no, you know where Assyria's at. They're not going to leave people down here to try to rule. It's too far from their native homeland. And if we can put a guy or they put a guy on the throne that's loyal to their cause, then we're back at square one where we want to be under native Egyptian rule. And who knows, maybe in time we build up enough power. Maybe they get weak enough that we can gain our sovereignty back. Whereas this guy over here is like, that ain't good for me. I want the Kushites to continue to stay in power. So who knows? Maybe that's part of what this means, provoking Egyptians against Egyptians. And then, of course, two separate kingdoms now, one under Kushite rule, one under Assyrian rule, where native Egyptians continue to live as they have for centuries. In verse 3, and I will frustrate its plans. What plans? Well, one of these Kushite kings by the name of Shabaka of Egypt. He apparently wants an alliance between the kingdoms of Judah, Sidon, which you know is way up there to the northwest of Israel, you know, as goes the ancient Phoenician kingdom, and then Ashkelon and Ekron, two of the capital cities of the Philistine kingdom. At least as, as far as Judah is concerned, these plans will not only be frustrated, they will not come to pass. Why exactly does Esharadon want to come down here and conquer Egypt? And when he does, he winds up going against these very peoples. And either he completely dominates them, and then not only conquers and puts his own vassal king in charge of them, meaning a native from their land who is going to be loyal to Assyria, 
or he reduces them to a client kingdom that is under direct Assyrian rule. But Judah escapes all that. How does Judah escape all that? Judah continues to be its own sovereign kingdom until 586. That's another 50 years, or uh, almost uh, 90 years from this particular time. And, and, and don't check my math. I'm not a math major either. Where are you? I don't know. <laughs> not that stuff. Anyway, having said that, they are a sovereign power for some time yet. How exactly, when they're sitting directly in the middle of all these kingdoms that Egypt wants an alliance with, did they somehow escape Assyria crossing their borders and then kicking their king off their throne and saying, we're in charge now? I'm guessing because Judah decided, hey, Egypt, that's cool. You do you. We are not a part of that. And Assyria got that message loud and clear. And they don't come harassing Judah and leave them alone. And ultimately, that's because it's not part of God's plan for the kingdom of Judah. Huh? Jesus, that's right. So, if, if Judah is allied with Egypt, that's the thing though. If Judah is allied with Egypt, then what does that imply for Judean independence? Imagine the scenario where Egypt actually gets what it wants, a full-on coalition of nations, and when Assyria comes in, they just take the stick out of Assyria's hands, break it over their knee, and kick, it, kick them out of there and send them running back home to mama. If they won that, and Egypt is the one who is the mo most dominant kingdom, how is that going to play in Egypt's favor as goes all of these other kingdoms that entered this alliance with them? What do you think will happen to them? Well, they'll probably be subject to Egypt. Exactly. And if e Egypt now is the one calling the shots, what does that look like with respect to Judah? Are we not back where we were at the beginning of the book of Exodus where Israelite is now, or the Israelites are now back under Egyptian sovereignty? Absolutely. That's a problem. So if you think about that, Egypt, even though they seem to be painting themselves in this picture as being Judah's allies, knowing their schemes are a little bit more nefarious than that, if God is pronouncing judgment against Egypt, now it seems to uh, come to light a little bit more clearly as to why that is. Why he is coming to rescue someone from Egypt's dominance. So far, who do we think is being rescued from Egypt's dominance? Judah, right? Okay. So, slavery to Egypt, that's a real possibility. And of course, that's a picture of Yahweh being, and that, or I should say, how does the picture of Yahweh the cloud rider work against that? What would you say? Yahweh the cloud rider showing up to delve out judgment and rescue. How is that picture being factored into this geopolitical scheme going on? So is it possible he'll do it again? Yeah. And in this case, it won't necessarily be a full-on exodus per se, them leaving the land, but at least saving them from the grasps and clutches of Egyptian dominance if Egypt's plan in best case scenario works. Civil war. Hmm? Yeah, of sorts. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's going to be a, a multifactorial thing, right? Because the Assyrians are going to come, and they are going to frustrate the plans by delving out judgment that's already kind of been pronounced into some of these kingdoms around the area. And we're going to test the metal of what Egypt is actually offering. That's the big thing, too. Egypt's made a lot of grandiose promises at this point, but Assyria hasn't come to test any of it. When Assyria actually does enter the battlefield... Will Egypt hold true to what she said she was going to do? And what does that spell out in the end? Well, chapter 20 is really going to give us a really concise picture of that, but we'll get some hints along the way. Any questions so far? I know this is a lot. I want to make sure everybody's kind of clear on it so far, enough to be able to move forward. Okay. Verse 4 and beyond. I will hand over Egypt to harsh taskmasters, and a strong king will rule it. This is the declaration of the Lord of Armies. The water of the sea will dry up and the river will be parched and dry. The channels will stink. They will dwindle and Egypt's canals will be parched. Reed and rush will wilt. The reeds by the Nile, by the mouth of the river, and all the cultivated areas of the Nile will wither, blow away, and vanish. Then their fishermen will mourn. All those who cast hooks into the Nile will lament. Those who spread nets on the water will just give up. Those who work with flax will be dismayed. Those combing it and, and weaving linen will turn pale. Egypt's weavers will be dejected and her wage earners will be demoralized. So, I will hand Egypt over to harsh masters. That creates a picture of what familiar scene? 
a people subjugated. Them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Them a few chapters ago and all the way back to the Exodus story when the Egyptians were the ones holding the whips, but in this case, they're not. They're the ones being put under the lashing rod. We go to verse 5. And the water of the sea will dry up. The river will be parched and dry. We're already kind of getting glimpses here, going back to that story of how that ultimately ends, as goes Egypt's part in that Exodus narrative, with God drying up water, right? And that, too, was to the judgment of the Egyptians when those walls of water come crashing down on them. Obviously, that picture is not what is playing out here. Here we have something else, as goes the devastation that is going to be leached out <clears throat> through Egypt. And we have to understand, starting with the Nile, and just about every one of these sources of water that are referenced here are the Nile, whether we're talking sea or river, canals or channels, right? Because that's how they wind up creating such a lush area of uh, crop harvest is by digging off tributaries that will allow for irrigation to happen in the land once the Nile floods and deposits its rich silt up on the banks of the river and whatnot. The irrigation canals are filled and that continues to seed water out to those areas where they'll grow all that they do. So the Nile is the source of life of Egypt, both mythologically, because it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the ancient creation tales of Amon, which most of those fall up under the umbrella of Amun, or even the sparse creation tales usually center around Memphis of Ta being the creator god. Either way, the source of life is the mound that comes up out of, you guessed it, the Nile. And of course, it's literally their source of life. I mean, it's the thing that determines whether or not they're going to have a good harvest year or not. Either the Nile does its thing and floods its banks and deposits the rich silt, or it overfloods its banks and it stays flooded for quite some time, and then the entire harvest season is completely ruined because it's now a boggy marsh. You can't grow anything in for the year. Hence, seven years of famine in the days of Joseph kind of thing, right? All right. I'm back. I may just have a really terrible name and haircut. I'm going to my head. But uh, who is the fierce king in the hard mountain? Ah, good question. I, I, I love the nerdiness and looking at details like that. I don't know. I would say... This Because Bible writers are seemingly divided, at least into four different possibilities. This very well could be the conquest of Cush into Egypt. It could be looking farther forward into the Assyrian conquest of Egypt. If we're looking... Well, yeah, I was going to say, even if we're looking at a bit more of a timeless complex here, and the, uh, or concept, and the idea that maybe it's the Neo-Babylonian uh, Empire or maybe even Persian rule, because every one of those empires are going to have some measure of dominance or strong influence and either create whole lengthy dynasties that rule over Egypt for some time, right? So after the Kushites are kicked out, there's a brief kind of interregnal period uh, between when the Kushites rule Egypt and when the Assyrians rule Egypt that Egypt falls back under native Egyptian control, but that for the most part doesn't count because it's kind of under Assyrian client king status, basically. Uh, but they do have a separate Egyptian dynasty until eventually the Assyrians come and they just decide, no, we're going to rule it ourselves. Anyway, so then we get all these other references here. Canal stinking, channels, uh, or uh, channel stinking, canals being parched, and everything drying up completely to the point where it's culminating in fishermen just walking away from their trade because they're getting nothing. There's nothing to sail on to get fish out of from the picture that we have here. And if there's no crops growing, then obviously reeds and papyrus can't be pressed into paper or formed into uh, linen to be weaved into the fabric that Egypt is most well known for. So if the fisher trade and the paper trade and the clothing trade are all shut down, and these are the staple products of your civilization, what does this now become the setup for? A complete economic collapse. So if Egypt is making all these grandiose promises then, of how they are the ones to rely on because we have all the resources that you need. We know that you don't individually have the money necessary or the armies to stand up against Assyria, but we do. Not only do we have the armies, but we have the resources to pay, to feed your armies. We've got the food. I mean, after all, the grain stores of Egypt was the food bed of much of the ancient world, right? That was one of the things that really kind of pushed the scale well, at least the volatile situation, I should say, to the point of breaking between Octavian and Mark Antony, 
when Mark Antony decided after the famine that had struck Europe and Octavian was in some ways negotiating diplomatically with Mark Antony for the grain stores of Egypt to feed the legions that were on the brink of starving and Mark Antony wanted Octavian to cede more territory to his control, Octavian just decided I'll sail across the Mediterranean and get it myself if that's how you want to be. So if the country is on the verge of economic collapse, how can they support military campaigns against Assyria by funding and fueling Philistia, Judah, Moab, Edom? They can't. Hence, God's frustrating of those plans. 11 to 15. The princes of Zoan are complete fools. Pharaoh's wisest advisors give stupid advice. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am one of the wise, a student of eastern kings. Where then are your wise men? Let them tell you and reveal what the Lord of armies has planned against Egypt. The princes of Zoan have been fools. The princes of Memphis are deceived. Her tribal chieftains have led Egypt astray. The Lord has mixed within her a spirit of confusion. The leaders have made Egypt stagger in all she does as a drunkard staggers in his vomit. No head or tail, Palmer Reed, will be able to do anything for Egypt. So the princes of Zoan being complete fools, it's like, why reference these places? Well, it's important for us to understand. Looking up on the map, I populate for you a little bit of a cross section. <clears throat> that dot way up there at the top of Egyptian territory is a spot known as Tanis. Waiting for eyes to percolate, you're like, I know that word. Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's right, that's where they found it. No, right. But Tanis is also known, this is the Greek name, its ancient Hebrew name would be Zoan. So this is one in the same city. And it's important for us to recognize that because Zoan, and this is not original to me, quoting it from another source, was the capital of Egypt in the 21st to the 23rd dynasties and the northern base of the Ethiopian 25th dynasty. Well, guess what frame we're operating in here? This is the time of the 25th dynasty when Cush reigns supreme. The princes of Zoan have been fools. The princes of Memphis are deceived. It's entirely possible we could be talking about native Egyptian nobles that are still in good favor with the ruling class of the Cushite dynasty. This could also be strictly Cushite nobles, especially those of the royal family, right? And Memphis is being pulled up here as it already has been for a second time. And the reason being is because Memphis was at one point an ancient capital but it is also the place where when it was captured by a Sardon in 671 BC and it was sacked, the prince or the son of the Pharaoh at that time, Teharka, which is a biblical figure, he's mentioned for us in the scriptures, that son was captured and he was taken all the way back to Nineveh as a hostage and presumably died there. So at this point, when a Sardon comes to town, as I've said before, and sacks Memphis, this is the time when Lower Egypt, or the northern half of the kingdom, is ceded over to complete Assyrian control and a new Egyptian dynasty carved out with a native king placed on the throne. So all that to say, these people that purport themselves to be wise men, how did they not see this coming? Right? I heard tell the other day of apparently a psychic who won in a court case because they had to go to the ER for an emergent issue, and when they got there, the ER physician thought it best to do a CT scan of their chest, abdomen, and pelvis, but in do and I think maybe their head, and in doing so, the radiological exposure messed with their psychic abilities, and they sued the physician, and ironically enough, won. The premise of their legal argument was that this messed with their psychic abilities, and therefore they couldn't earn a living anymore, which one would think if you're psychic and can see the future, did you not know that was going to happen? I'm just saying. <laughs> right? So if you are wise men, how do you not see this? This is something that your gods should be giving you information about. They should be exposing the, uh, the secrets of the occult to you through your practices of divination and the offering of sacrifices so that they could tell you how to prepare for such a thing so that Egypt doesn't experience its twilight when a new power comes to dominate their land. But they can't. And it's not just Assyria, but who's the one orchestrating all of this? Who's the real puppet master pulling the strings behind all of this? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. God, he's the one doing it all. 
There's no way they could know because he's the one that reveals information to his prophets on his terms. So now this brings us to the closing portion of this chapter. There's a lot going on on this slide. So as you read, I would say periodically, maybe every 10 seconds or so, you might want to pop your eyes up to the screen because stuff will be getting thrown up there. All right, let's read these verses. On that day, Egypt will be like a woman and will tremble with fear because of the threatening hand of the Lord of armies when he raises it against them. The hand of Judah will terrify Egypt. Whenever Judah is mentioned, Egypt will tremble because of what the Lord of armies has planned against it. On that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear loyalty to the Lord of armies. One of the cities will be called the City of the Sun. On that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the center of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near her border. And it will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of armies in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and a leader, and he will rescue them. The Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and Egypt will know the Lord on that day. They will offer sacrifices and offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and fulfill them. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. Then they will turn to the Lord, and he will be receptive to their prayers and heal them. On that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Assyria will go to Egypt, Egypt to Assyria, and Egypt will worship with Assyria. On that day, Israel will form a triple alliance in Egypt, with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing within the land. The Lord of armies will bless them, saying, Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance, are blessed. Let's get busy. So, Egypt will tremble with fear because of the threatening hand of the Lord of armies. In what context could this happen? When Egypt would be terrified at just the mere mention of the name of the kingdom of Judah. I mean, there's never been a time in their histories where they've ever been a threat as a separate kingdom from the unified kingdom under David. When David pro approached their borders and ruled a kingdom from the brook of Egypt all the way up to the southern half or portions of the Euphrates River. But he never invades Egypt, right? There are good relations between Egypt and Israel during the time of Solomon because Solomon marries an Egyptian princess. Seemingly that would be the motivation behind such a decision. But even though that's the case, Egypt, not that we could ever tell, would have reason to be afraid of Israel, much less Judah. That is, I wouldn't even go as far as to say at half strength or power of what they were in their former glory days under David and Solomon. But in 701, Sennacherib, this should be a familiar name, comes to us from both Kings and Chronicles, from the story of Hezekiah. He's the particular Assyrian emperor who, after Hezekiah rebels against the Assyrian emperor, and he does so at the prodding of Egypt. And we'll get into that later on in the context of chapters 28 uh, and uh, places like 38 and 39 and so forth. <clears throat> but just hinting at that now, but... I have to throw that in here at the moment for the understanding of the context of what's going on here. He rebels against Assyria, and when Sennacherib catches wind of this, he comes to town, and he does so for the purpose of reducing them to a client state, meaning no puppet king anymore. He is going to rule it all himself and strip it for all it's worth. He dominates and destroys 46 fortified cities in Judah's kingdom before he comes to the last city, the capital, Jerusalem. But around this time when this is happening, when he invades Judah, because this isn't an overnight thing. You don't conquer 40, 46 fortified cities overnight, right? We're talking months worth of campaigns. Egypt attempts to make good on their promise to Judah to defend them by fielding an army at this little place called El Teke, which is just north of Ashdod. So this is Philistine territory. So if Philistines or the, uh, Philistia has aligned with Egypt, they would have no problem with Egypt either marching armies or making a by sea approach to bring armies up into their borders and territory to then go fight Assyria. It was defeated by Sennacherib. And in all the promises that Egypt made to these kingdoms, this was the one and only time they sent any army to help anybody when Assyria came to put their hand in the cookie jar. So obviously all that blustering and blowhardedness proved to be nothing in the end 
But what does this mean, though, with respect to how Egypt is going to become prey to Judah and fear them, again, just by the mere mention of their name? So if this is the same king, Sennacherib, who after defeating 46 fortified cities in the kingdom of Judah, and there's nobody left to come and help them, Egypt has been taken out, so there truly is no one who can come and save them. And yet after he, as he says in his, in his own annals or records of how he came to conquer Judah, he pinned up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. Hezekiah truly is shut up in the city, right? We, we see the context of the story. The Rabshakeh, the Rabsaris, the Tartan, the commander of the army, they come up there to taunt and intimidate everybody and say what's going to happen if you attempt to try to fight any more than what you already have. We're offering peace. Come on our terms or else we're just going to squash you. Hezekiah doesn't even show up to that. He's in the temple praying. And Isaiah coming to tell him they won't fire so much as an arrow into this place. And that night, an angel of the Lord comes and decimates their army. 185,000 soldiers do not wake up the next day. Now, if you're Egypt, you're Egypt, and here you hear tell that in one night, Assyria has an army at least 200,000 strong standing outside the stronghold of Judah, Jerusalem, to come and tear it to pieces. And the next day, there's hardly enough to serve as an envoy and caravan to get the king back home, which is where he goes as soon as they wake up the next day. Accident of the report. Yeah. So, how do, if you're Egypt, does anything ring true in the back of your mind about stories from your own people when these people, the Israelites, were once amongst you and the God that they served did the same thing, visited your kingdom in the middle of the night, and death prevailed to the point where there was wailing and crying that night such as never had been or ever will be in the land of Egypt. You're Egypt now. You just got your butt kicked by Assyria, but they're talking about Judah and Judah's God. You think maybe that strikes fear into their hearts? It would me, because there's no explanation for what happened here. None. It defies all rational and logical thought. Now, let's take this and start this exercise of paralleling the end of this chapter with the top of the chapter because it seems like we've been doing this for a little while, at least an hour. So it's easy to lose sight of what we've already talked about in the three sections of this chapter we broke down. Remember, the image of the cloud rider, God coming to do judgment against Egypt, and he's saving Judah from the clutches of the schemes that they want to get Judah involved in that's ultimately going to cause them to be subject to their whims, right? It says in verse 1, Egypt will lose heart. At the bottom of the chapter here, we get this picture that when they think of Judah and her God, they will tremble with fear. Egypt will indeed lose heart because the cloud rider has come and vengeance is in tow. Back to verse 18. So we're going to be doing a lot of flip-flopping around, so I would urge you to keep your eyes up there. On that day, five cities in the land of Egypt, and before my man Aaron asks, I'm going to say I have no idea what five cities these are, so I'm going to beat you to the punch. <laughs> Egypt will speak the language of Canaan, swear loyalty to the Lord of armies, one of those cities will be called the City of the Sun. Now, we'll say as a caveat, there is some manuscript evidence that it could be a different rendering and a different interpretation, but most scholars seem to feel more comfortable with the translation offered here of City of the Sun, Heliopolis. So we'll go with that, and if that's the case, then the city that is dedicated to the worship of Amun, Ra, the sun god, is going to be completely overhauled and repurposed to the service of who? The cloud rider, Yahweh. So... Egypt speaking the language of foreigners is a sign of their conquering, obviously. And the city dedicated to the worship of Amun, the sun god, will become a sacred site now unto Yahweh. Going back to verse 2, each will fight against his brothers. So obviously, derision and confusion will fill the land at this time. But ultimately, how does this end? Not in this picture of chaos and confusion, but everybody being consolidated around one purpose— a unity of a hive mind of sorts in which everybody swears loyalty to the God of all creation, that all the nations now will be worshiping. On that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the center of the land of Egypt. Whereas, you think about it, at the beginning of this chapter, they are poised again as enemies against God and his people. But if there is an altar in the center of the land dedicated to the Lord and they've all sworn their fealty to him, if they started this chapter as enemies, then they end this chapter as what in relation to Yahweh? 
Hmm? Followers, his people. That's what he says at the very bottom of it, right? So what has occurred then? For enemies to now become followers, friends, sons, what will we call that? Re reconciliation, right? You read my mind. It's like you just pulled that right out of my mouth. There we go. When they cry out to the Lord, as he goes on to say in this verse. Remember, when we go down here to verse 3, in the bottom half of that, we found them first inquiring of worthless idols, ghosts, mediums, and spirits. But they're not going to be doing that anymore. Instead, their voice is going to go up to the Lord to inquire of him, to not only inquire, but even to cry out in their moment of dire distress and need. And what will we find him doing in response to all of that when they cry out because of their oppressors? <clears throat> Egypt calling out to Yahweh for deliverance from her oppressors puts Egypt in the context of what story? A people who are enslaved and oppressed and crying out to God who then shows up to say, I have heard you, and I will deliver you. What story is that? But in the Exodus story, Egypt is playing what part? They are the who. But now they're going to be what? Exactly. It's amazing what God does with these stories and totally turns them on their head to show what he is going to do out of his sheer grace to people who are at once enemies. Man, if this doesn't connect with Romans for you, when Paul is talking about how we were once enemies and are now reconciled as sons and daughters. This is where that thought process comes from in the Old Testament. We see it being pronounced of Israel's worst enemies. He will send them a savior and a leader. What was Moses to the Israelites, right? And he will rescue them. But in this case, it's not the Moses of old, but who? Come on, Bobby, say it. I know you're itching to. That five-letter word that starts with the J. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, that's right, man. He's going to send him the Messiah. <laughs> Jesus, and he is ultimately going to be the one to launch this final Exodus phase. So, <laughs> let's think of it this way. Yahweh made himself known to Egypt in judgment in the Exodus story. But now he will make himself known as their God. Obviously, this is a complete reversal of the paradigm of the Exodus story. And he'll go on to say this very thing as we read those verses again and them offering sacrifices and making vows. This is Levitical language. This, these are customs that are ascribed as cultic practice to God's covenant people. If they are invited to do this, then what does that mean they have been invited into? I just gave you the word. Covenant. That's right. We haven't got to this yet, but we know prophets are going to get to the stage that are going to announce a new covenant that's not just for Israel. And we will hear the words of Isaiah when he says in 49, the servant will have a task, a mandate that goes beyond just resurrecting and reuniting the broken houses of Judah and Israel. He will be a light to the Gentiles as well. <clears throat> the fact that he says the Lord will strike them, striking and heal them, and then they will turn to the Lord and he will be receptive to their prayers and heal them. This is nothing other than the language of restoration from exile that comes to us from 2 Chronicles 7. This is the alternate version of Solomon's dedicatory prayer. It's more exaggerated than what we get in 1 Kings 8. And we have that very famous line, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, repent of their sins, turn from their wicked ways, and return to me, right? I will hear them and heal them. This is exactly what he says. I will be receptive to their prayers, hear them and heal them. Egypt in exile, but God delivering them through an exodus, to bring him to himself in a new promised land that he's going to go on to describe here. Now, heal them, whereas he said at the top of the chapter he's going to turn them over to harsh taskmasters and a strong king who will rule over them, right? He doesn't have their best interests at heart, whereas now God is their benevolent king, as he has been for Israel, with their best interests at heart. On that day, there will be a highway from Egypt, like God speaks about how there was a highway in the wilderness that he led his people on out of Egypt to the promised land. But this highway is not simply to take Egypt out of their land. Egypt won't have to leave their land. They can stay in their land. But a highway that will connect Egypt to Assyria. This is big. Because after all we've talked about so far in this chapter, what role has Assyria been playing in this? If Egypt is the captive, the oppressed, who do you think fills the role of the oppressor? Right? We've been talking about Taharqa and the battle against Ashardon and the splitting of the kingdom and the taking of the king's son as a captive. Assyria is the threat. Now, they are everybody's worst enemies. 
and to say that Egypt and Assyria are going to join together as a solitary people and a massive superhighway is going to join their lands together such that one goes to the other and the other goes to the other <laughs> and they all worship together? What is this madness? Who is the one who can not only reconcile people to himself but people to each other? The cloud rider, right? <clears throat> he kind of already foreshadows this with the idea of even though these words are given in judgment in verse 5 of the water of the sea drying up, yet in other places, especially in Isaiah, he talks about parting the Euphrates into seven different streams so the people can walk across it in this massive exodus to come out of exile back to Mount Zion and God's presence there. So, and on that day, Israel will form a triple alliance. Let's... Take a break from this for a second and just explore a few other things. I, I, I boxed in some words there in verse 19, so I'll take it back. I'll pop it back up there just so you see it. This concept of an altar being there. I think in some ways this is kind of reminiscent of the days of Joshua. So you think about it. Once he disbands the army and then he finally tells the eastern two and one-half tribes they can go back home. They start making the eastern migration back, but before they cross over the Jordan to go back to their homeland, they do something. And it not, it's not seen very good or positively to begin with, and it almost instigates a civil war. What was the thing they did? Bible Trivia 101. They built an altar, a massive, huge altar. And they're thinking, are you serious? I mean, after what we just saw happen here, we're not going to do that kind of thing again. And they're like about to go kick their butts for what they did. But then when Phineas goes, the high priest at the time, to inquire, they tell them, we want to make sure that our progeny after us never lose sight of the fact that we are together, we're one people, so that our generations after us do not think when they ask themselves, what part do we have with Israel? We live over here, and then we break all bonds of fellowship. No, this altar is a witness that we have an inheritance with you, and we are one people. To say that this altar is on their border, right, or in the center of the land, because there is an altar also on the border and a pillar there as well, the idea is that this could be a witness to say that the very thing that God claims at the end of this passage is what is true. That Egypt now is a part of God's people now and forevermore. But on that day, right? It's not at this particular present moment. It will happen on that day. On the bottom of the screen there, verse 25, the Lord of armies will bless them saying, Egypt, my people. You know, by Moses, it was basically once declared to Egypt when he went in there telling them the words of the Lord that they worship. My people are in you. You let them go because you are not my people. I have come to take my people away from you. But now Yahweh will say to those who were once not his people, Egypt, you are my people. It's phenomenal. So any questions on chapter 19? Where's that moment? Where are they in all of this? Or where are they physically located? Well, in all of this. So they, you think they don't want to whoop the Syrians? They do, but not yet. And that won't come for almost another century. It will take some time, but there, there is some waxing and waning here of Babylonian control. And, you know, there are different tribes of Babylonians. The Chaldeans are the one who will eventually arise to the place of ascendancy where they can gain enough forces and coalesce enough unity amongst their people to then oust their Assyrian king who rules over them. And then, by virtue of that, signal to Assyria, we're coming for you. And that happens under Nabopolassar, Nebuchadnezzar's father. So let's quickly... Would this be a chapter that was added into Isaiah's scroll, or is this later, or is this, this part of Isaiah's prophecy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say this is probably completely separate from 19. Yeah, not only by virtue of the fact that it's marked by a separate chapter moniker, but that these would not have not even been spoken at the same time, but that they are arranged in this way after through chapters 18 and 19, we have Cush Egypt oracles being juxtaposed on top of each other to show us this pronouncement of woe, but redemption and mercy, but then chapter 20 as something of an explainer to make this all kind of flow a little bit more smoothly on how God is going to do this. So this is not given in that poetic stanza form that you have seen almost everything else, but more or less just re regular narrative prose to kind of show us this is what it really looked like in the ground level, you know.
So again, this isn't even an oracle. This is just something that it was either perhaps added in there afterwards to just bridge us from where we are here to the next piece. So in chapter 20, in the year that the chief commander sent by King Sargon of Assyria came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it, during that time the Lord had spoken through Isaiah, son of Amoz, saying, Go, take off your sackcloth from your waist and remove the sandals from your feet. And he did that, going stripped and barefoot. The Lord said, As my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot three years, as a sign and omen against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush, young and old alike, stripped and barefoot, with bared buttocks, to Egypt's shame. Those who made Cush their hope, in Egypt their boast, will be dismayed and ashamed. And the inhabitants of this coastland will say on that day, Look, this is what has happened to those who relied on and fled for, to, to, and fled to for help, to rescue us from the king of Assyria. Now, how will we escape? You see, around 715, Egypt under Cushite rule begins to kind of unsettle the lands of the Near East by coming with their promises of resources. Now remember, 715, and it's 760 or 671 when Esaradon comes and finally sacks Memphis. So quite a bit of time here, some decades between the two. They promise military aid if these kingdoms will rise up against Assyria. So by 713, Ashdod, which is again one of the five capital cities of Philistia, is in full-on rebellion. So what happens? Assyria comes, and they have their king deposed. And when they depose their king, uh, eventually Assyria kind of backs off. And when that happens, Philistia feels emboldened to be able to oust the king that Assyria had set up over them. So a, a Philistine loyalist to the Assyrian cause. And when they oust that king, they put up a new king over their throne, and then they begin sending out emissaries to the kingdoms of Edom, Judah, and Moab. And then in the year 711, Sargon II sent his Tartan, or commander, to reduce the, client, or the kingdom of Ashdod to a client state. And guess what? Egypt offered no help. So all that to simply say, that in all that will transpire with respect to this, and I give you that historical purview only for the simply, simple sake of saying, Egypt has showed their true colors. And what has now been pronounced against Egypt is that they are going to wind up being disgraced and humiliated when the Assyrians do come to town. And several native Egyptians and Cushites will be carted off as slaves. And you see the physical description there of what that looks like. And then everyone standing in awe with mouths gaped wide open will wonder if they did that to Egypt, what chance do we have, right? I know that kind of seems a little bit disjointed from the high note we left off of in chapter 19, but nonetheless, it's a truth with respect to what will happen and the fate that they will suffer at the hands of the Assyrians. So, any questions to conclude our session? Yeah, so by the time the Cushites finally are kicked out, that is almost a period of a little more than 100 years that the Cushites ruled over a unified Egypt. So we're talking, you know, this, this is the 8th century B.C., so early, late, or, or uh, early, late, early 8th century B.C. That's the dates we have to work with now, and who knows what archaeology will prove later on in the future. Right, especially when for three years he's walking around nude like this. Right. So for three years you're just waiting on bated breath. I mean, with things that happen in our news cycle, we, we, we feel like a four-year lapse between a presidential inauguration and re-election seems like an eternity. And so much happens in between that time period. But for one guy to be walking around naked like this, <laughs> saying at some point the Assyrians are going to come to town, and many of these kinds of prophecies will see decades pass before their ultimate fulfillment, right? And maybe still in the life of the prophet nonetheless, or at least immediately after the life of the prophet, which would oftentimes instigate the collection of those oracles into a book form or scroll to be preserved because, oh, now we have the vindication of the prophet and we can say he is indeed a man of the Lord because what he said would come true did. 
<clears throat> but yeah, and, and you know, I, I can feel you on that. It's hard to. My thing with them is like, like even the Israelites. How many times God got a cushion when you build them back up? And then the Egyptians, you know, with the Exodus. You know, they've been warned one time about it. Or are, are y'all not reading your history books? <laughs> right. Some yeah. people don't learn from history either. It's amazing. That's so <laughs> true. That's so <laughs> true. That and if you don't learn from it, you know you're bound to repeat, repeat it, right? Or you think you, you feel invincible. This is not going to happen to us. Or we've got something figured out that they didn't. Yeah. Or you just don't care. You know, some of that winds up falling into the realm of myth and superstition, right? And it's, it's also hard to accurately, with 100% accuracy, totally reconstruct what their thought processes were the day. I mean, there's been a time in biblical theological development when we have kind of given a little bit more weight and credence to the idea that there were several generations or decades, maybe centuries, in which Israel's not even worshiping God. But then we go back to re-examine the text and we realize, no, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems like Israel is worshiping Yahweh syncretically with other gods or whatever, you know. So granted, a lot of times it's dry reading, but sometimes those higher levels of biblical scholarly reading can really clue us into some stuff that we're we, we really need to have a good grasp on as Bible students if we want to get a full breadth of the picture. But even that is not going to get us 100% the way there because it's like, well, how, how, what did they really know? And how, what were they thinking at the time? It's outside of these words, we just don't know. But you would think, how many times you got to be shown? But I guess once is not enough. Anything else? Thank you for your time.